say hey happy sunday morning if you're on the west coast sunday, sunday afternoon. 11 a.m west coast time here we are it's so good to be here all together i just i feel like i say this every week but i love envisioning people who i know and love sitting around watching tv and it yeah, feels like watching true. tv watching church and it feels <laughs> like we're so close and all together so welcome to church home here we are by the way my name is chelsea my husband judah good guy been married for 129 years yeah we look so good just for our kidding. age that's just what the quarantine feels like <laughs> been married for 20 years you have three kids and uh we get to we get to lead church home which is the absolute delight of our life and obviously being in such a unique season it so many things in life it feels unique right from our kids to church but it's so great to engage on so many platforms so if you're here whether you're on instagram or facebook or the church home tv app which is so great maybe you're watching sitting around the living room with your family you can put it up on tv so that's so that's great cool. an easy way to watch church all together by the way or maybe you're here and you're on a zoom call with a bunch of friends watching church together that is also such a great way to watch church and be a part of community it's so fun to do what we're doing all together so welcome if this is your first time here we are we are church home and this is how here we are and this is church and we get to do it in so many different ways i think it's really exciting actually to be a part of a new way of doing things and see god reach new people in different ways so um even though a lot of hard things are happening in the world we really are seeing the good in it and the beauty of it and hearing a lot of amazing stories of people doing great things so it's great to hear it is we love it hey so if this is a newer experience for you in just a second i'm going to step off judah has a message that is really really amazing you liked it i love already it. did it I at the 9 a.m service three so. points which really makes me happy because i love like yeah, i make them point so that <laughs> and he has a message it's going to be about 30 minutes and then after that i'm going to come back and we're going to have some community moments together because we really are passionate not just about giving you content although content is great but right. really creating a sense of community and so we'll give you some ways how to get involved in that community and then after that we're going to have a moment of worship and some music and reflection just to think about god and how good he is and hey if this is a newer experience for you if you don't believe about Jesus the way that we do, you're going to find out really quick that this is not a, a religion. We aren't just following some Christian rules yeah. and ideals, but Jesus really is a real person who we have really encountered and met and who was so real to us. But if you haven't met him that way, if you don't believe in him the way that we believe in him, it is okay. Right. You still belong here. You're still welcome here. And you're not going to hear about the things that separate us as humans. You're actually going to realize that our perspective is we are all humans on the planet at the same time, and we actually have so much in common. So you can just take a deep breath and um, enjoy the message because it's really good. Amazing. Thank all you right. for saying that. You're <laughs> okay. I love you. Did you find your seat? Okay. Yeah, it's the only one. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, I'm excited to share uh, the story of God with you today. I love you, church home. Uh, wherever you are participating, engaging, connecting with us, we love you. I want to pick up where I left off on Wednesday. For those that don't know, uh, just by way of announcement and information, I preach a new message every week now on Wednesday and Sunday, so different messages. That's twice the messages I'm, I normally write, but why not? It's quarantine. It's an opportunity. Uh, we probably all need it. Uh, I, even my study's been good for me. So yeah, you can pick up Wednesday's message uh, on the Church Home app or on uh, probably Instagram and Facebook and those kinds of things. So you can pick that up. We're going to go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. One of the most famous quotations, statements, phrases ever made by Jesus. Here it is. And the title of my message today is How to Take a Real Rest. How do you really get rest during such a, uh, well, a solitude and such silence um, that, that that so many of us are experiencing, uh, just by just by default in during this quarantine. How do you take a real rest? We're going to talk about that. Luke chapter nine, verse twenty-three. Jesus is quoted saying this: "If anyone desires to come after me, if anyone wants to follow me, work with me, believe in me, receive me, he must number one deny himself, take up his cross daily." Jesus says, and follow me. goes on in verse 25 and says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but in the process lose his soul, lose his essence, lose his inside? In other words, Jesus says it's not a fair trade. You get all the stuff and the things and the recognition and the accolades that this world has to offer, but in the process you lose your essence 
and your soul. Not a fair trade. Amazing statement made by Jesus. And again, I want to use this passage to help us understand how to take a real rest. Will you join me in prayer? God, thank you for the minutes and moments that we share. I thank you for what you're doing. Church at home all over the world right now. We pray that you would encounter us and meet us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for these minutes and moments. Without your presence, without you uh, truly in the room, uh, this is an exchange merely of history and ideas. But we want to have an encounter with you, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, God, thank you for the last dance, episodes five and six tonight. Uh, I'm actually so looking forward to it. I've watched the first four episodes multiple times because it's the closest things to live sports we have had in weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, Speaking of hiking, which I don't think we were, but speaking of hiking, Chelsea loves to hike. Um, I don't. uh, I don't like going on intentional inclines. That's not like a thing. I don't go, I want to see an incline where I can climb. But that's really what Chelsea loves. Now, when we got married 20 years ago, I loved golf. She loved hiking. So we committed. She would learn to love golf and I would learn to love hiking. Neither one of us have done that. 20 years into marriage, uh, I don't prefer hiking, but I actually do hike. Chelsea does not prefer golf and does not golf. Okay, so, uh, babe, honestly, if you could not interrupt the sermon. (laughs) That's true. She does watch a lot of golf. I do want to say that. So, to that end, we've both made some efforts, haven't we? But recently, I was hiking with you, quite a bit, actually. During the quarantine, we have been to some very uh, domesticated trails. Yes, I understand. But nonetheless, we've done some hiking together. And recently, we were on a hike. Uh, Of course, the motivation is purely to get away from our children. But the point is, we're on a hike, and we went up a little incline, just a little incline. I would would say it was the equivalent of approximately six steps in your home. I got to the top of the incline, and I noticed in the middle of the conversation I was having with my wife, I was having a tough time. (laughs) I'm catching my breath. And you ever, you ever like, kind of been embarrassed that you can't catch your breath and you don't, like, want, like, your best friend and the lover of your life? Like, you're, like, like she's t- we're talking probably about our kids and parenting and how we can get better. And I'm, like, ah, that's a good point. That's a good point, but I'm trying to, like, take deep breaths so she can't hear me. Here I am, six steps into an incline, and I cannot catch my breath, which makes for a great metaphor. In light of this quarantine, in light of this global pandemic, which is excruciating, painful, and so many friends and loved ones I know who are experiencing loss, who are experiencing difficult, difficult days. I will say I have found it challenging to truly rest. And what I mean by that is we may be stationary, we may be on our couch, we may be watching a movie or show or The Last Dance, and yet nonetheless, I still don't feel rested. You ever spend all day on the couch and the next day you're more tired? And you're like, I wonder if it's physical rest I need. Maybe I need emotional rest. I need inside rest. Well, Jesus invites us to soul rest. He invites us to have rest for our soul. I love Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, another quote of Jesus. Jesus says, according to the Message Bible, he says, come to me, And I will show you how to take a real rest. That's where we get our title today, how to take a real rest. I think what you and I need today here at Church Home, we need a real rest. We need emotional rest. We need spiritual rest. We need soul rest. We need internal rest. Well, easier said than done, right? I know how to sleep or nap or relax. How do I get rest for my soul? I want to talk about today how to take a real rest. Now that brings us to Jesus. He's in front of his 12 disciples, the 12 young guys that followed him around for approximately three and a half years. He's there in front of them. That's his audience, nobody else. 12 Hebrew young men, 12 Jewish young men. And he says to them, if you have a desire, if you have an inkling, if you have an inclination to walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it, Here's how it's going to be possible. Here's how it works. You must, number one, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, Jesus says, and follow me or surrender to my direction, surrender to my approach. Deny yourself, take up your cross every day, and yield to my approach. 
I want to show you how this is actually clearly an explanation of Jesus, how to take a real rest, how to learn to trust, rely, and rest in Jesus, which will give you a confident ease on a daily basis. Are you interested? Are you curious? I certainly am. How do I take a real rest? Well, it starts with two words, deny yourself. We talked about this on Wednesday. Deny yourself in our English language, in 2020, in our Western world, modern culture, right? It kind of reads like self-help, kind of reads like self-effort. Deny yourself. Okay, don't do that. Don't do that. No more ice cream. No more gummy bears. You know, I'm going to deny myself, deny myself. And so a lot of people today living believe Christianity is a religion. It's a list of rules in how you deny, how you say no to what you really want, what's fun, and what's enjoyable, because it is about denying yourself. Well, if you take that phrase and you go back in time thousands of years ago, you realize the nation God built to demonstrate his character, his love, and his care, the nation none other than, none other than Israel, he actually instituted a thing called Sabbath. Now, for those unfamiliar kind of with Old Testament, there were three different covenants established or arrangements for connection with God. There was the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and the Mosaic covenant. Now, within the Mosaic covenant, that is a covenant made with a guy named Moses, God instituted and diligently, passionately instituted a thing called the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath is a 24-hour period where the children of Israel, the Jews, did absolutely nothing. And it was a day of worship to acknowledge that while they did nothing, God did everything. It was Sabbath. Now, if you go back to places like the book of Leviticus, for instance, which I rarely read, to be incredibly honest. If you go back to Leviticus and Numbers and other Old Testament uh, uh, books, you'll discover this phrase, deny yourself. In fact, it's over and over. The instruction... God gives to his country or his nation that he built was, hey, once a week, deny yourself. Once a week, lay down self-help, self-effort, doing hard, trying hard, do, and deny yourself and rest. So I want to be very clear. When Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, which we read a moment ago, when he says deny yourself to his 12 Jewish young disciples, what they heard with their history their background and their language was Sabbath, was rest. Now, something very dynamic happens in this quotation, in this phrase and statement by Jesus, because he says, deny yourself, listen now, take up your cross daily. Now, that daily is connected not only to take up your cross, but also deny yourself. Now, it gets interesting because these 12 young Jewish men would know deny yourself speaks of rest and Sabbath, which was once a week, and yet Jesus just said, deny yourself, take up your cross every day. Why is that? Well, because we understand in the teachings of Scripture, based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus fulfilled absolutely every rule and requirement of the Noahic, Abrahamic, and Mosaic covenants, which is to say specifically Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath. So now the rigorous adherence to the Sabbath, a 24-hour period, has now been transformed and changed. Jesus has fulfilled that. He has become our Sabbath. And now I got good news. Every day is to be a day of rest. That's why it says daily. Deny yourself daily. Sabbath daily. Rest in Jesus daily. How do you follow Jesus? You learn to rest in Jesus daily, and you acknowledge his cross as your own, which we talked about last week. So again, I want to expound on that, continue what we talked about on Wednesday, and let's dig in now for the next few moments how to take a real rest, which is to be a daily practice for you and for me for those of us that follow and worship Jesus. And for those interested in worshiping or following Jesus, this is a great opportunity for you to get a window into what a daily practice of loving, following, worshiping Jesus would look like. It looks like 
rest. I got good news for you today. If you are a Jesus follower or you're thinking about Jesus being a Jesus follower, one of the great hallmarks of who we are is rest. Trusting, relying, letting go of control and leadership, and trusting God in that. Three things I want to show you laden in the original language that's revealed to us in this portion of Scripture. Number one, we rest in the works of Jesus, or the work, or Jesus' work. We rest in his work. Deny yourself means to let go of what you do, what you've done, what you've tried to do, what you've accomplished, or the identity you've got from what you've accomplished and done. You let go of that, and you rest in the work of Jesus. One of the seven statements Jesus said while six hours hanging on the middle cross between two criminals, not the least of which was, it is finished. What's finished? The work of Jesus is finished. The work that we could not do for ourselves, Jesus did for us. He didn't just pay for our sin, our error, our wrong, which all of us have committed. He became sin. And that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your relationship with God has nothing to do with your work. It has everything to do with Jesus' work. And so today and every day, we rest in the work of Jesus. We let go of ego, which tells us our worth and identity are connected to what we've accomplished or done. We let go of that as Jesus worshipers and followers, and now our worth, now our identity, now our confidence and our security comes from I must be worth something because God put on skin and bone. He moved into the neighborhood. He went to the cross for me. He rose again, and he paid the ultimate price. Therefore, that's who I am, and that's what I'm worth, and I rely on, rest on, lean on the work of Jesus and not my own. Let me read to you again in 2 Corinthians. I just quoted a moment ago, 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. It says this, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Jesus, he's a new creation. Old's gone, new's come. In other words, sin, error, wrong. Old is defining myself by what I've done, what I've accomplished, what I know, how smart I am, who I know, what I, right? All that is old. The new has come, my identity in what Jesus has done and what Jesus has accomplished. And then it goes on and says, all this is from God. What a phrase. And through Jesus, he reconciled us to himself and gave us, church home, please hear this, our ministry Church home, our ministry is the ministry of reconciliation, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. Our ministry is reconciliation. Our mandate is a community. We exist to ensure that man can reconcile his or her relationship with God. It goes on and say the way we do this is through the message or the story of reconciliation, which is right now. We are saying that the greatest plight in all of humanity actually is our our endless craving to be connected with our creator. It's innate within us. We're born with it. We want it. We desire it. Whether we're aware, conscious or not, or unconscious, we have a craving and an inherent desire to be connected with our creator, to be reconciled with our creator. And only the work of Jesus can produce that and make that possible. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. It goes on. Therefore, verse 20, we're ambassadors for Jesus. God making his appeal through us. We implore you. We implore you, be reconciled to God. Boy, as Paul writes that, be reconciled to God, he gives us how, and I quoted this verse a moment ago, for our sake, Jesus, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become right with God. I want to say something about our church. We we have decided today we are going to rest in the work of Jesus. Can I tell you something about sin, your error, your wrong, your selfishness? It is not comparable. It does not compare. It does not measure up to the work of Jesus. Your sin has been forgotten. 
Your sin has been forgiven. Your sin has been paid for. Do you know what church home? Church home is not about sin. Church home is about the finished work of Jesus. Our focus is not sin. Our focus is him. That's how you know the good news is being declared. That's how you know the ministry of reconciliation is being proclaimed. The focus is not sin. The focus is on the one who forgives sins, who covers sins, who paid for sin, who became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Can I make an announcement to you? The sin you have yet to commit, Jesus already became so that you can be forgiven and confident and peaceful and at rest today, your heir, your wrong, your sin has been forgiven, and we rest in Jesus' work. We rest in Jesus' work. What does it mean to find a real rest? It means to rest in the work of Jesus. The second thing, it means to rest in Jesus' way, in his ways, to yield and trust his ways. Look at what Galatians chapter 6, go with me to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14 Paul says this, we're trusting in the way of Jesus. We're resting in the way of Jesus. Far be it from me to boast except, except in the cross of Jesus by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Isn't that interesting? Paul says the world, the system, the word world there means system. It actually means fragmented, broken, selfish system. I have been crucified. I no longer live according to the values and ideals of the system around me. For instance, have you ever tried to control or manipulate results and or recognition in your life? Have you ever thought to yourself, I've got to, I've got to control these results. If it's going to be, it's up to me. And I got to control these results. And how much energy emotionally is drained from my mind and my soul as I try to manipulate and control results and recognition? Trusting in the way of Jesus yields control, as if you could, anyways, to things like results, recognition. Of course, the craving for certain results and certain recognition lead to this thing we all struggle with called comparison. And the Bible says don't compare yourselves amongst yourselves. It's not wise, right? There's always going to be somebody bigger, brighter, smarter, sharper, and you're going to find yourself in that place going, what's wrong with me? No, I tell you what we do. We rest in the way of Jesus. There's this thing called the sovereignty of God. God is all powerful. God is sovereign. God is in control. God is leading. God is guiding. God is our good shepherd. He is a faithful leader. He's a faithful guide. He's a faithful uh, 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 a captain of our ship, if you will. And he is guiding you. He is steering your life. You know, the Bible says the steps of a righteous person. Remember how you get righteous? Not by your work, but by Jesus' work. The Bible says if you're righteous, you can be sure that every step you take, God's involved. Guiding, leading, guarding, keeping. Can you imagine this afternoon, if you spent the rest of your afternoon completely relinquishing the appearance of control you and I think we have over things like results and recognition? How about this concept of risk? When you start thinking about resting in the way of Jesus, resting in Jesus' ways, you know how we define risk? Risk is a new job. Risk is a new career. Risk is moving cities. Risk is change. Any change is risk. And we say, oh, that's so risky. I'm going to tell you, it actually, the life of Jesus by the world standards is full of things that seemingly are so risky. But I'd like to introduce to you to the surest space or place in the universe. Do you know where it is? It's the surest place. It's right behind Jesus, where he is guarding you and keeping you. I love how James says it in in, in the book of James. He says, you know, you say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go there. I'm going to do this. He says, you should say, you should say, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills. That doesn't mean every time you go to Starbucks or you go to In-N-Out Burger, you go, well, if the Lord wills, I'm going to go to Chick-fil-A. If the Lord wills, I'm going to get a latte. It's, It's not speaking of being... Uh, weird and, 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 and kind of odd about this. It, it, it means you just have a yielded, open-handed approach to your everyday schedule. Oh, God's going to lead it. 
God's going to guide it. You ever had a conversation with someone and they're doing so much, it gets you all worked up that you're not doing enough? And you start going, oh, man, I, I need to do that. I should do that. I should do that. Welcome to social media. Am I right? Like, I should do that. I should post this. I should go. I should do that challenge. How many challenges are we going to have, right? I can't keep up with all the challenges, all the challenges that we're being challenged by friends and do this and do that and this charity and that charity. And it's like, ah, right? And suddenly you're like, I need more results. I need more recognition. I need, uh, and, 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 and it can get overwhelming. What about the posture that says, I trust God with that? God will give me the desire. He'll give me the energy and the strength to do those things. And as I do them, I'll trust the result and the recognition to God. Risky? Maybe at the end of our life, they'll say we took big risks. But you and I will know there really wasn't much risk at all because the surest place is right behind Jesus. And wherever he says, hey, let's go here, you go there with a sense of confidence that what God started, he'll be faithful to complete it. Oh, we rest in Jesus' way. And lastly, as we come to a conclusion, we rest in Jesus' wisdom. Not just his works, not just his way, but we rest in his, in his wisdom, in his wisdom. We rest in the wisdom of Jesus. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, see if I can find it before you. If you're looking in your Bible, and by the, yeah, you're, the, the, the Bible app doesn't count, okay? That's, that's cheating. But if you have a, a, a paper Bible in front of you, 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, check this out. It says this. Paul says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I didn't come to you. My sermons and stuff weren't, weren't with a lofty speech or wisdom, he says. For I decided, please hear this, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith not, might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Passion Translation says, I have determined to be consumed with one topic. I'm going to be consumed with one topic. You know how you rest in Jesus' wisdom? You live your life consumed with one topic. Doesn't mean there's not other topics. Doesn't mean that you don't acknowledge other topics or understand that some of those topics have a time and place. But the primary topic, the obsession you have, you're consumed with one topic, and that topic is what the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus did for you and all of humanity and the universe itself. Paul is one of the brightest minds to ever grace the pages of this storybook. And yet he says, in fact, in other, other portion of scripture, he says all of it's waste. It's like waste. It's like garbage compared to the resurrection and crucifixion of Jesus. We rest in Jesus' wisdom. Notice, Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, I, I don't want these sermons to hit you in a way that you think it's crafty, lofty, wise words from a man. You know what I mean? Like, wow, that was really, that was really that was really good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try those three things. I'm going to try those five things. He, he says, no, what I want you to be left with when I'm done talking about Jesus is his person. When it says power, it means the person and presence of Jesus. That's what it means. It's essential to you, that you feel a sense of him. And that brings us back to a story where we concluded on Wednesday. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. To be honest, it's Jesus taking three of his 12 disciples on a hike. Shout out to hikes, right? Jesus takes his guys on a hike. They get to the top of this mountain, and Jesus starts to pray. And the guys do what they normally do. They fall asleep while Jesus prays. When they wake up, they wake up to a phenomenon. Jesus is, his clothes are brilliantly white. His face is shining and it's, it's transcendent. But suddenly they realize Jesus is joined by two ancient Hebrew men, Hebrew heroes, Moses and Elijah. And they're having a conversation. And P Peter, we know for sure, wakes up and sees this conversation happening. And he notices, evidently, he, he knows it's Moses and Elijah, apparently. The way they look, I don't know, I don't know what it is. But, of course, these are thousands-of-year-old men. 
it's just wild, right? They're from another dimension, another realm, a place called eternity or forever. And they're there talking. Do you know what their conversation was about? It was about how Jesus was going to fulfill all the things they taught, said, and the edicts they gave. Elijah, the great prophet. Moses, the receiver of the great Ten Commandments. And the leader of the children of Israel. And they're there with the fulfillment of it all. Jesus. Peter sees this scene, and he does what we still do today. Peter sees Moses. He sees Elijah. He sees Jesus, and he thinks to himself, oh, my word, it's like three heroes together, three peers almost. He says, Jesus, it is so good that I'm here. Classic. What I'm going to do is I want to build three shelters, tents, tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. In other words, Jesus, it's so good that Moses, because it's like Jesus plus the Ten Commandments. Let's honor the Ten Commandments, and let's honor Jesus. You know, it's Jesus and prophecy or knowledge. You know, Elijah, it's Jesus plus prophecies and knowledge and predictions and the wisdom, it's, it's, and so Peter does what preachers do today. Peter does what I do today, what we do today. It's Jesus plus knowledge. <clears throat> it's Jesus plus rules. Moses and Elijah, law and prophets, law and prophets. The law and the prophets are talking to the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, and Peter thinks they're peers. And just to send a message loud and clear to everyone willing to read this book, a fog, a thick, thick cloud or fog settles in over the guys. While Peter is basically communicating that Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are all peers. And the cloud settles in to send a message overtly. This is not about Moses. And this is not about Elijah. And there will be no memorials to a man. This is about one. Cloud settles in. They're actually afraid. The Bible says they were kind of fearful. Like, well, what's happening? The cloud lifts. And guess who's not there? Moses or Elijah. Guess who's not there? Wisdom of men. Knowledge, rules, regulations, and empty principles removed from a person named Jesus. They're gone. And if I could be so bold today to say, God, give us the cloud again. Help us to focus again. Help us to not get caught up in the wisdom of this world and merely as the church of Jesus be a dispenser of knowledge, regulations, rules, and traditions, all of which have been transcended, exceeded, and categorically fulfilled by the person of Jesus. The Bible says, and then the fog and the cloud lifted, and they were all alone. In fact, one translation says, and it was Jesus alone. And it was Jesus alone. We at this church, as far as church home is concerned, we will not build memorials to the wisdom of men. We will not anchor ourselves to customs, traditions, knowledge, regulations, rules, or laws, all of which cannot produce a right relationship with God. So in that sense, they are indeed powerless. Powerless to grant a man or woman a relationship with God. Always they fall short. You can curate all the knowledge of the world, and the Bible says it'll lead to arrogance. You'd be puffed up. We're not here today celebrating mere knowledge and concepts and, 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 and rules and regulations. We are here celebrating a person. And his name is Jesus. And so we're determining. We're making a decision. We're going to rest in the work of Jesus, the way of Jesus, and the wisdom of Jesus. You know, the Bible actually says Jesus is the wisdom of God. He is the wisdom 
of God. Look what it says. Verse 5, I, I want your faith not to rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. <laughs> so what's happening right now as I'm talking is you are experiencing the presence of in person of Jesus. It's called the power of God. It's the spirit of God right now. He's on your front porch. He's in your backyard with you. He's in your condo. He's with you and your roommate right now. He's with you in the living room. If you're a single mom with your child right now, that's, that's the presence and power of Jesus. Cling to him. Oh, it's... It's not about who knows the most. It's about who knows him. It's about him. It's about him. It is not the wisdom of men. Today is not a pep talk. I'm not a success coach. This is not a rally. This is none other than the community of Jesus Christ. And it is here we rest in, rely on, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And he loves you. So I want to make a commitment to you. I feel like I've been doing a lot. I mean, a lot of this during the quarantine. I want to make a commitment to you. As the pastor of Church Home, we will commit to the ministry and message of reconciliation. And that message is not complicated. It's that we cannot be reconciled to God by our own deeds. We cannot find our own way to God. We cannot build cheap imitations of the wisdom of Jesus by the wisdom of men and think somehow we will accomplish what only God can accomplish. Now, our ministry is about a person, and he's the only one that can reconcile man, mankind to God. I'll tell you what we're going to commit to. We will build no memorials to mere knowledge, to mere rules, principles, success keys, all of those things have a tiny little space in this thing called world, life. I'll tell you what this is all about. It's about a person. He's present right now. He will confirm his ways. He will confirm his story with his power, with his presence in your home. That's how we're going to do church at home all over the world. You say, well, I'd sure be nice to be in a room with Chelsea and Judah or nice to be in a room with, let me tell you who's in your room, Jesus. <laughs> he said, he said we'd get together and he'd be there. He promised he'd be there. His power and his presence is in your home right now. It changes everything. You can't earn it, deserve it. He did it all for you. He loves you. He loves you so much. Blow your mind. He's so proud of you. Rest in him. Rest in him. Rest in his work. Rest in his way. Rest in his mission. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for your presence today. And I sense your nearness in this room. I sense your presence in this room. And I believe it's in every room watching right now. And I thank you for that. If you're here today and you say, Judah, I would like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers, for it was his work that accomplished it in your place and mine. If you'd like to receive that, just one moment of receptivity, that's all. Can't earn it, deserve it, or understand it all. You just believe it, receive it. If you'd like to do that wherever you are in the world, even if outside, or even in your car, and you're listening right now, I'm going to ask you, on the count of three, to lift up your hand if you'd like to receive the free gift of Jesus. I think when you see your hand go up on the outside, it just makes it even more real what's happening to you on the inside. I'm going to count to three. You just lift up your hand. One, two, three. If that's you, just lift up your hand. God, I thank you. You see every hand. Important, you see every heart and every soul. And I thank you we are forgiven forever and completely. 
and we rest in that and we rely in that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Love you, church home. Amen. Yeah, love you so much. Thank you for that, babe. That was so great. And hey, just wanted to invite you, if you lifted your hand or something in your heart exploded to say, yeah, I think I want to know Jesus more. Or maybe you don't even know that yet, but something stirred inside of you. Think, I have, I have some more questions and I would love to talk to somebody. Can I invite you? We have a whole team that's standing by on Pastor Chat, either at churchhome.org or on the free Church Home app. And they would love to talk with you, either to lead you on your next step with Jesus or just answer any questions that you might have about him. I know I was watching the service on a social media platform and there are such great, amazing conversations about who Jesus is and does he even exist. And those conversations are never scary. Those are actually really encouraging because Jesus is so real to me. There's no way I can't know that he's there. And we have a whole team of people who have encountered him in the same way that Judah and I have, who would love to really talk with you about Jesus. I love that statement Jesus made where he he said, J Jesus, uh, Judah, Jesus talks to me too, but they sound a little different. Uh, I love the statement Judah said, where he said, the most secure place we can be is following right behind Jesus. And we want you to know that you have that security, that you're walking with Jesus every day of your life. So we'd love to help you with that. Anything you can do to join Pastor Chat or talk with us, or even if there's something going on in your mind right now, in your life, you're feeling alone or isolated in this quarantine, we would love to pray with you and stand by you. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning of service, we aren't just here to get content out to the world, although that's a part of it, but we are really passionate about building a community around the person of Jesus. And there's so there's something about such a depth of relationships that are centered around Jesus that we want to help you find and discover. So anything we can do to help you, just hop on Pastor Chat. And even if you don't know what to say, just say, I I'm here, help. We know how to take it from there. The team is great and prepared and would love to talk with you and pray for you. But also one of the things we do when we gather around community is take a moment to talk about finances, both the finances that is church home, which are really the generous giving that you give to church home, and also your personal finances. You know, in the world we're living today, our finances feel like they're so much under attack and under so much fear around our finances. So first of all, can I just say thank you for your consistent giving to Church Home to enable us and allow us to do what we continue to do. If you're interested at all in giving, there's never any pressure, but if you would like to give to continue to do what, what we're doing, you can just text the word generosity to 97,000, which is 97,000. 000. Just text the word generosity. And, and even if you do that, there's no obligation, but it just leads you for some prompts for how to give. And you know, every gift is significant. But what I love about Jesus, the message that Judah preached, he talked about that Jesus wants us to have true rest. And I also believe that Jesus wants to have rest in our souls regarding our finances. And we are living in a world that is under so much turmoil right now, specifically in regards to finances. And if you find yourself there, that is a normal human condition right now. But there's a whole book in the Bible, it's Matthew chapter six, where Jesus talks about that we can live a life that is free from worrying about finances. And if you find yourself there, I'd love to encourage you to read that chapter sometime this week and really let the words of Jesus speak to you. But I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but at the very end of that chapter, in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 33, Jesus said this. He said, hey, you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. He said, but instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, your daily needs will be met. And can I encourage you that that verse is for you? We don't have to worry about our finances. Instead, we can actually seek the kingdom of God first. And for Judah and I and for Church Home, one of the most practical ways that we do this is for, is by something called a tithe. And a tithe for us is simply giving the first 10% of our income, any money that we receive, the first 10% goes to God. And there's no pressure. We aren't trying to buy his righteousness or buy his love. The truth is he already loves me so much. But for me, that is a way that I can say, Jesus, I trust you with the first fruits. I'm seeking your kingdom first, and I'm trusting that all of these other things you are going to take care of. And for me, that has been such an incredible way to be released from worry around finances. So if you're interested in that, or you, again, would love to have a conversation, the team is standing by, would love to you to talk to you about tithing or even about giving and how you can live a life free of worry around your finances.
Well, church, we love you so much. We're so grateful for this time together. We're now going to move into a moment of music and worship. And really, I believe that that gets the message from our mind into our, into our heart. I know the things that Judah were talking about are so counterintuitive, right? Like, I'm supposed to rest because of what Jesus did. And I, our minds can kind of get that, but we need to get it into our hearts. So join us for these moments as we take time around music together. Standing here in your presence in a grace so relentless, I am one. By perfect love, wrapped within the arms of heaven, in a peace that lasts forever, sinking deep in mercy. See, and I'm wide awake, drawing closer by grace. Oh, my heart is yours, and no fear removed, I breathe you in, lean into your love. Oh, standing here in your presence, in a great soaring By perfect love, wrapped within the arms of heaven, in a peace that lasts forever, singing deep in mercy, sing, and I'm wide awake, drawing closer by grace. Washing over me, your face is all I see. You are my everything, Jesus Christ. You are my one desire, Lord. In my only cry to know you all oh, my life. Your love so deep is washing. Your face is all I see. You are my Drawing 
Yours and no fear. 